Hi, Declan. Hello. Wonderful, wonderful to have this opportunity to, to speak with you. And, and I, I always remember how important you were for me at a very early stage of my journey. I, I remember when, when Alice and I tried to set up this eco village and environmental education center in southern Spain, um, we got a VW van and, and drove all around Europe visiting different eco villages and different sites. And um, you, at the time, were the um, president of, of the then relatively recently created Global Eco Village Network. So I, I came to Leben, Lebensgarten to, to visit you. And, and it was just so wonderful to, to connect. And um, it felt, felt like I'd met a long lost dad or some, something, which is like we, we just had on so many levels, we had so much I in common. I can say that actually, long lost dad, because I remember the first time meeting you in, in Findhorn, and we were sticking together quite a bit and hanging out together in all the, the intermissions and whatnot. And people were saying, is this your son? Is he? <laughs> I said, well, I'd love it to be. You know? <laughs> and so we got on very well. And then we just sort of sporadically met in, all the time in between. But there's one thing that I've been able to do with you, which it could do with very few people, is to, to catch on where you left off. Mm. And it's happening today as well, you know, I sort of have the feeling I've seen you just a couple of weeks ago. Yeah, yeah. and it's been, been a while. I haven't since seen you for ages. Yeah, yeah. But. It was wonderful when, when you came to Mallorca. It was the last time a few years back. But yeah. like in, this, in the, this, this series of recordings that I've been doing for a little bit over a year now is called Voices of the Regeneration. And in, increasingly, I actually want to go back into really whether whether at the time people called it regeneration or they called it permaculture or whatever, it, it, that's not sort of so important. It's, it's people who for most of their life have been aligned with the regenerative impulse of life creating conditions conducive to life, um, no matter what language they used. And, and your work has been pivotally important for so many people. And, um, and you've been around for, rather a long time. You were in 1934, is that correct, or 36? 34. 34. Um, and I, I often... this year. I, wow. <laughs> I, I often um, start with, with a question of asking my guests in these, these conversations to share a bit of their story, but from the place of how did you find your calling when when did it click all into place i know you studied architecture but was that already were you already on a clear path or was there any point where you suddenly just felt like this is my essence this is what i've i came here for um and yeah over to you where what what, what comes to mind you see i i started more on the on the on the cultura line i was uh, uh, dancing and uh, learning to be a conductor and and playing the piano and doing all this. so and I finished school at 17 and at that time they wouldn't allow me into university until 18 and I wasn't quite sure that I wanted to be an architect but I sort of had the feeling as the last of five sons my father who had wanted to be an architect but became a civil engineer because there was no architecture in Ireland at that time when he studied. So, and here was I, and I then realized at some point or other, uh, but I was all in, always an activist beside my studies, I wanted to be an urban designer, and not an urban planner, an urban designer. And that is how do you put these wonderful buildings together that they're not all hitting each other, but harmonizing with each other. We have so, Beautiful examples like Karlsruhe, you know, and, and parts of Paris and, and all over the world. And we've lost them completely. We've lost the idea that an ensemble is as important as the building itself. Right, that was the first thing. The second thing was, you know, I was born before the war in Ireland, mm -hmm. separated from everywhere because we were not in the war. We were neutral. And 
So my dad changed the tennis court in our garden to the vegetable garden. And my dad was so busy because he was working as an engineer all day from nine to five. And then he arrived home somewhere about six and he'd be immediately in the, in the garden. And I had a feeling that I wasn't having contact with him. So I got behind him and his heels and I was all the time helping him in the garden. It wasn't that I loved the garden, but I loved to be with dad, mm. you know. Dad was most important to me somehow as the fifth son, I didn't feel I was getting enough. And so I got it that way. Why? Right. That was so. So I got this whole idea. You can, you know, he managed in the war with a very minimal salary to feed 10 people, eight children and father and a mother. And usually some sort of a helper or governess or something like that as well. Why? Right. Okay, that's the sort of background that I come from. And then I realized uh, when I was already in second year in architecture that I really wanted to be an urban designer and then began looking around. I could do it in London, but I couldn't be happy in London. I was so, I, I felt London was a Moloch, absolute, you know, what do you say in English? A disastrous place at that time and with all the, it's coal fires and oh, you have no idea. I mean, oh yeah, we do have an idea. You got a bit of it in Scotland too, yeah, didn't you? So, but so I went further, and there then I met this guy in the Oktoberfest in Munich, who was an architectural student specializing in urban design, and you could do that in Munich, in Berlin and in Darmstadt. That's where you went, Darmstadt, no? And that's where I went then. I finally got a place there and they uh, recognized my third year in architecture as four diploma. And so I just had to do five semesters. Four semesters, but I did five before I got my diploma, which was the equivalent to a master's. And a master's in architecture and urban design, which Stettebau in German, mm -hmm. yeah? Right. And right after, uh, first of all, while I was studying then in Darmstadt, I didn't have any money. So I was, I was teaching English, but that was so wrong for my studies. And then I finally got a job as a student assistant. Mm -hmm. They used to call it Hilfsbremse yeah, in Darmstadt. And I was with this uh, half Spanish architect, but had gone, grown up his whole his life in Germany called Romero, Rolf Romero. Rolf Romero was 70% Kriegsbestätig. He was really a sick man, but a sick man who wasn't ready to take his sickness and was going like places. And he, um, he took me on because I was, had done, uh, he was design and history of architecture. And I had done a whole lot of digs in different places, high temple and whatnot. And so he knew I could do something. And then, and then I told him I wasn't interested in the buildings in high temple. I was interested in the town itself. And I wanted to do a reconstruction of the town. And the guy who was running the dig, he said, go ahead, you know, and I did it. And it's now in the, in the, in the, in the you know, in the museum there. So that was the next thing. Romero. Then Romero, because he was this unusual mixture of design and um, history of architecture, he was the guy who was in for urban renewal then. And he needed somebody who would think urban. And all his assistants, etc., they were all just pure architects. So I immediately got in with him. And not only was I a student assistant, but uh, shortly after I did my diploma, um, a, a year exactly, he asked me to come and be a um, business chaplain assistant, a scientific assistant, which is five years. And I thought that was great. Then Margaret could go on studying and finish her studying. And so, because Margaret had, uh, had our child in the middle of her studies. But she, she also studied architecture, urban planning. Yes, but yeah. no, she went more into 
Herstellungstechnik into um, uh, architectural technology. Okay. Mm -hmm. And that was her thing then, and when she became a professor years later, she had um, uh, ecological architecture and urban tech and, uh, and um, technology. architectural technology. Mm -hmm. That was her thing in Hanover. But um, to go on, see, in this, I was already three years in um, the university, and I was actually getting a bit fed up because, you see, I, it's awfully difficult, you most likely know it from your Irish friends, it's awfully difficult to tell an Irishman something twice. <laughs> you know, they, they, they get, they immediately tell you they're bored, or they immediately butt in on you because they've heard it already, mm -hmm. and they see that you're repeating it. And I was, you know, getting all this repetition in my studies. It's just, I was just, you know, I was really a, a tender hooks all the time. Margaret said, you could, you can't relax. I mean, the minister in the university, you can't relax. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, why? In three years, it, this possibility of doing um, urban renewal for the big city of Regensburg, mm -hmm. you know, which had something like two and a half thousand old buildings in it and beautiful structures, beautiful spaces, beautiful places. Mm -hmm. And Romero introduced me to this. Uh, thing. And, and so I got into this, this whole business of thinking big mm. and, and still being able to support. And then, of course, I got into participation and all the burger, beteiligung and all this sort of thing. And then a big thing, and this is where I'm building up to, happened to me. Me meeting Bill Mollison. I was invited to Romero again which I'd left, but I was always back and forth because Margaret was still finishing her studies. So I was invited to Greece by Dinos Doxiadis. Mm -hmm. And Dinos Doxiadis just blew my mind completely. I just, I guess because he was the first person that I met, urban designer who could think holistically yeah. and could really get space and social systems and everything going together. And he had this whole business of interdisciplinary work. And so I worked with him and I was his editor for his, his um, or assistant editor for his acoustics journal. I'm still on the advisory board. And- Can, can, um, can you explain to people what acoustics is? Because a lot of people probably won't know. Explain yeah, to me as well. Is uh, what he called the science of human settlements. And he said, this does not belong to architects. This belongs to architects, psychologists, sociologists, for fans, technical, whatever you call that. And almost every All the discipline in the university can bring this in. And therefore, it's really what the university should be, universal, university, universe, the universe. And here's Declan Kennedy talking about the universe of of Regensburg and, and, and you know, <clears throat> why? And of course, the, the whole thing, having worked for this man, history of architecture and design, I was also talking in different ages. I wasn't only talking in one way, mm -hmm. right? Luxiadis, I worked with um, on and off. I was always there for his, his month of acoustics and he invited people like Barbara Ward and René Dubois and, and um, Lady Jackson and, and Matthews from, from uh, Scotland and all the, anybody in the world he invited for July to, to um, Greece. And we had a seminar on a ship going round from one island to another. And the, 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 the experts would meet from nine to 12 discussing, and from nine to 12 in the evening again. And in the afternoon, they would visit some archeological sites like Samos or Kikaras or 
Pira, wherever it was. So I got to know Greece, and I had to do the minutes of those meetings. Yeah. And then I had to type them up and go put them through a Ronio, you know, yeah. and, and have them ready for the next meeting. So when they were finished at 12 o'clock at night, our work started, and there were three of us. And there was a geographer, an urban designer from Harvard who was just early retired, a woman, English woman, technically in theory, and myself. And we would do the, all this work and so really very as quickly as possible. And then we go up on deck and we would have Greek dances with the, yeah, with the staff. I was going to ask, was it in Greece that your, your love for circle dancing evolved? No, yeah, that's, that's been there all the time. Um, um, I, I started dancing when I was five. Okay. And I began teaching dancing, circle dancing when I was 17. And that was part of the way I, that I taught my way through university too, because mm -hmm. I, I just told the people you, know, you have to. And and you're still leading the community circle dance at Lebensgart Nico Village in the mornings when you can. Well, I'm leading it again because the younger guy, 20 years younger than me, mm -hmm. he's had two heart attacks, mm -hmm. and he can't. Well, he can just barely get from his house to our shop, sort of thing, and back and takes him a couple of hours sort of thing. And it's in a bad way, it's really very sad. But, um, you know, I'm back on, in on it and um, it's doing me a hell of a lot of good. Yeah? Because it keeps your right and left brain going together, you know? It's the perfect thing before a seminar or before a heady stuff to, to have half an hour or less of, da of dancing. I, I still, I, I actually, it's it's an appropriate time of year to be talking about this because when when I came to Lebensgarten, it was in in midwinter and it was really deep snow, and and so I have this image of you leading a circle dance and us joining in, in in the in the village square in Lebensgarten with the with the with the like a, you know when it when the snow just makes everything quiet, and you 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 don't hear your your feet and. Ah, it was wonderful. So it's, you're back, back at it. What good to hear. Well, yes. Um, uh, last Saturday, um, everything was covered with ice when we went out, mm -hmm. and I had this um, boom box and and um, and, a, and a laptop, you know, a, a, a tablet, mm -hmm. and and I fix it all up, and I and I put it on the bench to get the music going, and then I realized. The ice is it's so warm that the ice is melting around my box and my, my tablet, and they're getting wet from below. <laughs> it was sort of fun. But that's what we do. We still do it, yeah. And um, I'm now doing an extra one on Mondays to in the afternoon to teach my followers, because I've learned in the last two years, I have to hand over things yes. yeah. and especially abilities mm -hmm. and so this is partly this guy who's now working with me he's uh, next month he's 40 mm -hmm. and he is a really good mathematician mm -hmm. who can sort of yeah, put What's work structure together to and he is also really good at photographing and filming and so we're doing all sorts of things together mm -hmm. and we're still, because see i have a whole lot of different within our permaculture plot here and our permaculture plot has always been a research plot mm -hmm. trying out things and we're still trying out that's the reason why we're seen as being a charitable organization and so um but i have to keep going in making this available for other people. Mm, so, uh, so that's the point of life I'm at now. But this guy, Doxiadis, got me ready then from 10 years later or more, no, 20 years later. I was 48 when I um, heard about this guy in Tasmania and his young student. You were and, already 48? And then I went with Margaret mm -hmm. in a fortune semester from TU Berlin, Technical mm -hmm. University in Berlin. I was, I was then professor for urban design. 
I, okay, so you were already in a professor at the TU Berlin when when you heard about Bill Mollison and and then just took time off. Became, to, I became uh, professor in TU Berlin at 38, mm -hmm. and at 48, I heard about this guy, and we decided um, to go to Australia and have a look at um, what he was doing, and we invited him to Berlin, mm -hmm. and we actually started. And I brought permaculture to 17 European countries. I mean, you brought it to Europe and, uh, in, and then... And, and Ross and Hilder supported me. Mm -hmm. They said they would support the very first two permaculture courses in any new country of Europe. And because I liked it so much, Brazil. <laughs> and so they paid my fees. And therefore, the courses were, were cheaper, mm -hmm. which was a bit stupid at, like, later because then everybody thought permaculture courses should be cheap. Yeah. yeah. You know, and so it was hard on the, the further next, teachers. Yeah, yeah. Why, why would, you, would they charge more if the, the guy yeah. who brought it to Europe charged? But, but tell me a bit more about the trip to Tasmania and, and like how long did you, did you actually study with, with Bill Mollison? Well, the first, the first time and the beginning of it, I... I was there um, three months, mm -hmm. but I wasn't with him all the time. I was also with David, because David mm -hmm. at that time was 20, yeah. and he was just uh, 22, and he had just finished his master's degree, and his master's degree is actually the, the, the thesis that every element in nature supports each other, and not like Dharma says, is fighting with each other. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it, actually, even if the element so is... The map is in what? The, um, landscape planning. Also planning. Landscape uh, planning. Landscape, uh, landscape planning. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then and, and Bill was his, his uh, tutor. Mm -hmm. And Bill was a, a sort of pretty crazy guy anyway. And he had lived with the Aborigines and he'd learned how they did their self-sufficiency. And he was trying to push self-sufficiency. So it was a meeting of minds. And then they wrote this Permaculture One, the first book together, and they coined this word. And then um, David has just cleared that up with a, a, a special uh, article saying, he was actually the one who invented the principles mm -hmm. in his master's thesis but supported by this man who was all the time telling him, you're on something, you're on something, do it. And then he gave it over to Bill, saying, you are in the position to get this around and to spread it. Nice. And, and I, I'm not. I have to do something first with my life, and then I can do that. That's exactly what he did. He became a landscape um, designer, and he became then very quickly a... Uh, a, a permaculture teacher, mm -hmm. but um, he was, and then he did his own own um, projects. You, you mentioned something that that is worth um, diving into briefly because lately there's a lot of kind of old trauma and hurt coming up from different representatives in in um, indigenous um, tribes and circles saying okay this whole thing permaculture and now also regenerative agriculture and, and 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 the message of the regeneration is an appropriation of ancient um indigenous knowledge and um i've even heard some people say permaculture stolen indigenous farming and land care practices um i personally feel that if anything, it's a translation and bringing it back to a lost white people that, that needed that input at the time and still desperately needed. And, and that what we should do is, is no, it, work together. But what, what's, the, what's your take the on that? From the very beginning, mm -hmm. we, are, we are not the inventors. We are the person who just, just happened to put it together for the modern times. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, they, they say, uh, Bill says, you know, he led most of the stuff from the Aborigines, and he pulled in the Aborigines into his work all the time. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, he cut a, got going with this chemist in um, 
Japan with Masanobu Fukuoka. Mm -hmm. And Masanobu Fukuoka said exactly the same things. He, he said, we're going the wrong line with all these chemicals in the, in the, in the agriculture and in the foodstuffs. We're killing ourselves. And he was saying this in the 1970s. And <clears throat> that was what I got interested in, how I got into the whole thing. Because I saw, uh, see, I'm always, I've always been interested in nutrition, just purely egoistically, because I need it. <laughs> yeah? yeah? And But then other people need it too, so why yeah. shouldn't I? So, right. And then I was seeing, as an urban designer, I was doing all this lovely work for, in urban design, and, and, and uh, helping people to create beautiful places around themselves and of course plants became part of it but then I was seeing they were all getting sicker and sicker we had never so many doctors in in the history of mankind and we were all getting sicker mm -hmm. what the hell is happening and it's because we've just forgotten the old ways of doing things like you know I mean just your German system of sauerkraut is such a really interesting way of keeping something for months, but or years maybe even, and still having something that is highly nutritious at the, at the end. And so- And you know, reba rebalances- And um, that was the, the his third book was on mm -hmm. fermenting. Mm -hmm. It wasn't on permaculture, it was on fermenting. Mm -hmm. And how do, you, how do you keep things through fermenting, you know? And it's easier in, in Warmer countries than it is in, in, and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. Okay, we can go into that detail. But the whole thing was how do we get it recognized? How do we get it? And so on. this is the reason why I said I'm staying in academia, mm -hmm. although I'm a permaculture person and I can see this whole simple way of living, etc. My best friend is voluntary simplicity. Uh, um, Duane Elgin, mm -hmm. and we're always we're in contact and all the time for that simple reason that we hit up immediately on the simplicity thing. But but how did I, how did you live that that bridge? Because I mean it's a bridge that and not for that long and not at that level. But I that I've lived for example when I was at, at Findhorn trying to create master's programs at Findhorn College and bringing universities to the eco village to to study ecological settlement design and, and renewable energy and alternative currencies and all those things in, in place. Um, going around these 17 European countries, meeting kind of died in the wool grassroots people wanting to learn permaculture and then stepping back into your TU Berlin classroom. Um, how, how was that living, living those two worlds. And wh when did the Lebensgarten project come, come into all that? That was when I began to get sick. Mm -hmm. And when, luckily enough, I had this wonderful wife who realized what was happening to me. That I, in one part of my life, I was doing what I needed to do and following my bliss. And in the other part of life, I was getting more bored as an Irishman, as I was telling you before, you know, because here I was expected to tell the whole thing over and over and over again. Mm -hmm. And sometimes things that I didn't agree with. And um, yeah. And I and that was the reason at the age of 48, I, I learned this thing. Then I decided I'm gonna bring it into academia. Mm -hmm. um, I had one particular thing happen to me in the Technical University of Berlin. They didn't like the idea of action learning and action research. And that was just my thing. I mean, that just, you know, right. I found six and seven university professors in different parts of the Technical University through a group uh, of progressive uh, professors, the form group of Hochschule, mm -hmm. and we put together a research project to prove that the permaculture principles were also applicable to Northern Europe. Mm -hmm. And three of them were not German, but the other four were German. And I even got an okay 
from the ministry in Bonn at that time that I would get a 1.2 million D marks with these group and I could do um, feasibility study on, and we, so, and what? Well, and then I come back to my own university and the Forschungskommission, the Akademische Senat, has to okay it, otherwise the, and they turn it down. How many times have I heard, I'm, I'm, I've gone through exactly that, well, not exactly that story, but a very similar story here on Mallorca, like everything ready, 10 million funding for wonderful agroforestry research park set up, and then the local university can't invest 100,000 to land 10 million. <laughs> Well, they didn't even have to do that at that time. There wasn't <laughs> even this, this uh, so they only had to say that they were in a possibility and that they would support it, support it. The third of my salary, which was supposed to be there from research, which most of the artists didn't use because they were building, mm -hmm. that was their type of research. Now I want to use it for this. And that was the only thing that I was asking them to, they didn't even have to, say extra money, it was there already. I was getting paid that third, third anyway. Mm. And you see, then the thing was, every time I had a, a possibility of a fortune semester, because I was at the lowest level, the three levels of professors, I was at the lowest level, mm. uh, because I didn't have all these years of, of practice that I was supposed to be, but I was 38 when I was, in, when I was called to be a professor. <laughs> <laughs> and, and anyway, I'll, I um, can completely forgive them for everything because what it did for me was it put me in a position that I had to make the decision, I'm getting out of here. Mm -hmm. I'm getting back to what I need to do. And it got, brought me back into my creativity. It brought me back into my joy. It brought me back into life. I was becoming a panther, you know, so, and that's the other thing with, you know, the German professor has the, the, the university laws, but he also has the Bampton laws as well on top of that. Civil, civil servant. You know, it's, yeah. it's sort of, yeah, yeah, yeah. strangling. Yeah. And, right. and, and so is that when you I, start? I'm, kind of, I'm getting out of it. Huh? I'm getting out of it. I'm going to be ready to cooperate with them, etc. if I can, and if I can afford it. But so I went back into, um, you could say private practice, yeah? Mm -hmm. And I set it up here in, in, in Lebensgarten. I, I, I didn't take one house in Lebensgarten, I took two houses, mm -hmm. or two units that became, one of them became my office and the other is my house, still so, is. Tell a little bit more about it, because Lebensgarten is fascinating. It's an, it's an old um, ammunition factory of the Nazis, isn't that right? In the forest there was some sort of yeah, the ammunition factory is still in the forest there, yeah. and it's, it's under the level, it's mm -hmm. three stories down with telescopic um, chimneys and things like that. Mm -hmm. And they're keeping it to, as a sort of a relic. It's, um, and you can visit it with special permission and all that sort of thing. <coughs> and they're trying to, they're thinking of making some sort of a, uh, educational center uh, for people who want to really know what happened in the Third Reich and that sort of thing, you know? But, uh, but how, did, how did the eco-village, like, so you, what was the community looking for land and then asked the local authority? No, 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 it was, yeah. it was exactly the opposite. Yeah. This guy, and he's still alive, but he's now um, uh, also uh, in a wheelchair, um, although he's younger than I am, <laughs> uh, he, his name is, he doesn't want his name now, no. Mm. But he, his uh, father left him a um, factory in, um, in Berlin, which he didn't want to take, and neither did his brother, and neither did his wife, his, his uh, mother. Mm -hmm. And so they decided to sell it. And they sell, sold it as a going concern, got an awful lot of money, and decided to put their money into real estate. Mm -hmm. And then he got the idea of um, having 
a holiday home and he found this derelict settlement which had been built from originally 700 women for an ammunition factory which is almost a kilometer away in the forest. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> First of all it was too far for the workers Second of all, the architect said, this is my possibility. And he built a solid settlement of 40 houses and three or four big buildings. <laughs> the administration moved in. Administration of this, and the, which became a huge, big ammunition factory. Mm -hmm. And then prisoners of war were used to make ammunition to fight their own people, that sort of thing. Oh, really? And it was bad news. They were really badly, yeah. An awful background. After the war, it became a British army camp. And it was the British army on the Rhine was having a logistic center here. And they brought in everything with ships into Bremer Hafen and Bremen. And then they did the whole logistics of bringing it all the way down the Rhine to all their different barracks. So it was a barracks, you could say. And so each unit had um, eight soldiers and two officers. In, and these units are now our houses. Mm. There, were, there were no kitchens in it. There was one huge big washroom and one toilet. And the showers were in the, in the main building. The showers are now our community kitchen. Yeah. <laughs> and we rebuilt the whole thing because then it was eight years empty and was really ransacked. It was, you know, vandalized and whatnot. So we hardly had a pane of glass in any window oh, when we came. Oh. Lots of the roofs were, had holes in them. Some of the doors had been broken in. There was hardly a door. There was, you know, especially the hall doors. Our hall door wasn't even there. They just took it away. And some crowd that moved in. Mm -hmm. so, <clears throat> so we decided to, uh, and it was grouped, got together in Berlin, in Hamburg, and a very small group in Bremen, and even a smaller group in, in Hanover. But they decided they wanted to do an ecological and then we were all in on building biology, biology. Okay. And, and um, prior, sorry, this is prior to the whole founding of the Eco Village movement, the, the, the oh, yeah. Turban Report. This is, the, this is the, the Eco Village didn't exist yet at the time. This is 85. Yeah, okay. 1985. And, but the Eco Village movement and the Gen mm -hmm. was actually founded here in 93 and we only went public at the at that conference in which Vindhorn had caught up mm -hmm. and um and it was called um community settlements, and settlements for the 21st century uh, yeah. the, the Vindhorn yeah. conference yeah yeah but the two people who run it, ran it they were both already in our group mm -hmm. and the actual name the global ecovillage network was here in our bambus room um by Diane Gilman. She put the name together. She just said, listen, what the hell are we doing? We're a network, we're not a foundation. Mm -hmm. Second of all, we're talking about eco-villages. And we, we, I think we should go global. So we're global eco-villages. And everybody said, wow, you know, like, Eureka, we found it. You know? <laughs> right. and, and we had this big celebration here with Ross and Hilder and the whole lot, yeah. So when, no. when did you when did you connect? So so you you were part of the founding group that developed this site into the Lebensgarten project, and then how did you connect with that that crowd, like with Ross and Hildo and and um, then with through permaculture? Uh, because then I began being uh, so and Ross and Hilda immediately smelled something here, mm -hmm. and um, um, you know Max Lindica. Mm -hmm, was the first, uh, you could say, the first accredited permaculture designer mm -hmm. after Mollison and, and because he lived there and etc. And he 
was invited by the community of Swanholm mm -hmm. and my wife, Margaret, to do a permaculture course. And Hilda was in that okay. course. Hilda had already heard about it. And Hilda did the course a second time in New Zealand, where Bill was doing it, mm -hmm. with an Austrian guy called Joe Pleiser. And Joe and, um, did one of the best courses that ever was there, and Hilda was in that. So, and Hilda's a lawyer, you know, and or she was a lawyer. And, and Hilda, so Hilda was, had this lawyer thinking, and then this love for nature, and, and also her whole spirituality and everything was built around nature. <clears throat> so, uh, Ross was a businessman, but Ross could see that the world was going to pot with the whole ecological disaster. And then also he hit up with Margaret then later and they did all sorts of things together on the complementary currency direction. And he wrote this book called Occupy Wall Street while Margaret was um, writing, writing the book Occupy Money. They didn't realize it. And they, almost in the same, same two weeks, they brought them both out, you know. But it's so, so, I mean, Ross and Hilda's story is another whole, like, I, I must have a conversation with Ross at some point as well. Um, but the, the so we, now we've got the three musketeers are coming together. Uh, like, the, uh, where did you meet Albert Bates then? Like, was that at the yeah, finish? I'll go one, one step further. See, uh, the other thing was Ross and Hilda had a guy called Hamish Stewart mm -hmm. working for him and running their office in. Fjordvang up in two mm -hmm. in, in, in uh, Denmark. And uh, Ross and Hilda heard about us and through this course, and then they came down to visit us. Mm -hmm. And then they said, listen, we've made all this money and we promised to put 80 or 90 percent into the environment, that's what they said. We see that this is necessary and we can easily live from the 10% mm. or even 15 maybe, right? And then we suggested to them that they would support communities who are going in the direction of eco-villages because of the fact that no, they understood and in, in foundations and in government, what we were trying to do, and that we need all need starting start money. So that was the way they got going, and there was originally then, um, uh, Fintorn, no, well it was us, Fintorn, invited here, um, then uh, Max Lindiker. Uh, and Crystal Waters, so he was just starting Crystal Waters. And then we found out about the farm and we wrote to the farm and then Albert turned up. Mm -hmm. okay. And then they invited all sorts of other people, like the people who, do the, who did the um, magazine Yes. Mm -hmm. What's their name? Fran and, yeah. Anyway, they are both really good ecologists. Mm -hmm. And then <clears throat> the, we heard about a uh, Gaia Association in, in um, Buenos Aires, mm -hmm. who had just started an eco village outside Buenos Aires, it's still there. Mm -hmm. There was Sylvia and uh, Balado. Mm -hmm. Then we began looking, we said, the United States is so big, we have to go the other side. If we have uh, Tennessee, we have to go, and then we found out about uh, Manitou, mm -hmm. and that was where um, um, she's still around. Linda Jackson, Linda <laughs> came in, mm -hmm. and she's still in the Gen Elders, who a wonderful, uh, yeah, wonderful mind of organizing. Thing. So she did the first um, community self-assessment with me and, and her husband, Kailesh. And no. um, that was somewhere about 
96. Mm-hmm. So the, but, the, uh, then we all got together here. Um, Linda jo- Joseph, that's on Linda Joseph. Linda, and Linda, yeah. first time she ever went out of the United States was to come to Ladies Garden. Mm-hmm. And that was when this thing happened with the name Jen. Okay, the, see, see, this is new for me because I, I still believe the, the founding myth that it was at, at the Findhorn conference. Of course, Findhorn would tell that story that, that um, when all the com- communities had been brought together at the big conference, that people said, well, now that we're all together, what we're going to do, let's start a network. I didn't know that there was two years of background work already well, establishing. Well, two years of getting it going. And we had mm-hmm. all sorts of people in on it. We had Dan and Robert Gilman in on it. We had um, um, who weren't living in a community, but mm-hmm. thought it was a great idea. Mm-hmm. And he became a politician afterwards. Now he's a writer. And... Um, <laughs> For, for the for the sake of of those people who are not as steeped in the eco village movement as 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 we both are, it might help to just say that that Ross and Hilda, like Ross, um, created this what he called the money machine, um, which basically was speculating on offshore currency fluctuations and was able to predict them by about twenty four hours in advance, which enabled him to generate a lot of money and instead of... Well, that was really Bernard Leotard behind it. Uh, Bernard, really? ah, okay, Bernard did that. Okay, I didn't know that yep. he was already working with Bernard then. Yep. And, and then they just, like he decided to create Gaia Trust to basically yep. not spend the money on super yachts and um, whatever else billionaires normally spend their money on and, um, and started lots of different companies and and also funded a huge amount of projects. He, he basically funded the Global Ecovich Village Network from the beginning until now. Yeah, I, I, we really hit off so fantastically with them right away because um, see, Mar- Margaret comes out of a business family. Mm. You know, I, my dad had to be uh, a business person with all the children that she, he had, you know, to make ends meet. and. Um, and we were always ecologists, Margaret and I, but we always said we had to take care of the economic side. And that was the reason then, shortly after Margaret uh, got her uh, diploma in permaculture design, she decided to go that part of permaculture, which talked to it about eco- uh, economics. Yeah, and so that, that, I was that was great. She okay. then, and then she finally finished up by meeting all sorts of people who helped her in that direction as well. And yeah, I mean, well, I, I'm still, still working with her legacy, you know? Yeah. I mean, it's, it's a huge legacy that she created as really one of the pioneers of the local and regional currency movement and the whole kind of calling out, like I remember, how many languages has money without... Um, 27. In interest, 27 languages. Uh, it's a small little book, but it, it's really a spanner in the works. And seven after numbers. she died, was put into Korean. Mm. And um, yeah, uh, and it's, it's amazing. Uh, yeah, okay, that book is not out of date, but it's, um, it, you could also say, you could say it's, it's a basic book on interest-free money, because mm-hmm. that's what it's called, interest inflation-free money. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, creating a, a currency, you know, creating an exchange me- medium that uh, helps the earth. Mm-hmm. And, then, uh, so, and, I mean, then her latest book, uh, Occupy Money, the, the mm-hmm. one just before she died, she had another one uh, on, the, on the board, but that was a peculiar thing about Two months before she had her diagnosis, uh, the, um, this guy, a young uh, professor in Bavaria, uh, uh, writes to her and said, would you write the foreword to my book called Tralala? And then she gets this manuscript. She said, God, he's written the book that I was about to write. <laughs> Great, I don't have to do it. <laughs> <You know? laughs> It was always quite, I mean, you know, Margaret was an architect and it was quite an effort for her 
to keep up her writing, etc. She loved writing them. She loved literature and she'd always done. I mean, that was... Was that the regional currency book that she then co-authored? Or... Yeah, she got the regional currency book going mm -hmm. and then Bernard was here to visit us mm -hmm. and she was telling him about it and he said, oh, I'd love to do the historical part of it. Could we not do it together? And then she had a real problem with him because he wants to be on the front. He wants to be Bernard Lyotard and Margaret Kennedy. And Margaret said, first of all, this ladies first, and also Kennedy becomes before Lyotard. <laughs> so they did it in German that he had it translated into Spanish and into French, but he has the... Uh, the name the, the other way around. Yeah. <laughs> But that's also, the, all, I mean, what, what great, I mean, we've, we've men, me, mentioned a lot of people that have already moved on that, that have, is a really great losses to the movement, Margaret and Bernard and so, so, so many, um, Diane Hilda. Kilman, um, yeah. Hilda, myself. Hilda, yeah. Mm. But I was really lucky. I, I visited Hilda five days before she passed away mm. and had a, meditation with her and another friend and and um us all four of us together while she was lying in bed and meditating with us mm. and it was uh, really good because um then i went on to the from there to london to the permaculture international when i was there that was just before and then while we're in the middle of the permaculture national so we got the news that she had moved to the other side yeah. I, I remember spending time with her um, also only a few months before she passed, um, which was after the Gen Plus, whatever it was, 20 conference, I think, ah, yeah. at Pindhorn. And then we moved on to Newbold House to do a kind of meeting of the Guy Education Tribe. And here was Hilda already on morphine to the point that sometimes she would like, Get get a little bit loopy because and and but but name it call it out like still the the presence of mind of saying oh now the morphine's going through with me again and but but everybody yeah, I, I was, remember that lovely lovely yeah. ceremony that we did with the first Hilda Jackson Prize yeah. where she handed it over to four communities yeah. and and we had to do a, that was uh, Robert Gilman myself. And Hilda and 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 Ross, who were the jury, mm -hmm. <laughs> and and was really, really, we, we we were all doing it for the first time. You could say, you know, being a jury and then handing over a prize. So it's still going on. It's really good, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, but the thing is, the whole thing was, I only realized it about three years ago that, in point of fact, almost everything in my life got me ready to jump into this role of Mr. Permaculture Europe. And then that got me into the situation because I'd gone, got going with networking to get the Global Village Network going. And, you see, and, and I, I was then founding chairman and I was also chairman of and president of Gen Europe, because it happened then so quickly. It went, you know, from that Findhorn Foundation, uh, Findhorn Foundation um, conference in 95. It just went, jung, 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 jung. and I had a burnout in 1998. Yeah. I mean, was, from yeah. not having enough sleep. Yeah. And at the minute I, you know, and it all, all came out with it supposedly skin cancer which turned out to be not skin cancer at all, having been treated for 20 years and 17 operations. Yeah, just ridiculous. So I pretty well lost an awful lot of trust in the medical profession. <laughs> but on the other hand, they all thought they were doing the right thing. You know, I, I can't, and I accepted this. Mm -hmm. to a point and then I didn't accept it anymore and you see this is the sort of Irish in me and this is also the, the rebel in me you know I, I still I'm still am a rebel I, I still think the medical profession is really letting us all down yeah I mean you we were talking you were saying earlier that because you need nutrition you've always had an interest in nutrition and I was going to mention then that one of the key things that are just unbelievable for a 
supposedly civilized people is that that we still don't teach the medics about nutrition and food and the people who produce food we don't teach about medicine uh, and, and 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 human health and and those two i mean ayurveda for the the the, the indian tradition has always seen food as the central bit of medicine you don't need to have a pharmaceutical industry if you have a good good diet to some extent uh, so and then and of course then permaculture growing food that actually has all the micronutrients in the food like we're, we're now getting to understand how important that actually is that, that but to see they didn't have that in us at the beginning yeah they had they were all they were so in the abstract on the one hand and so on in the in the <coughs> just production of food, but not the actual. I mean, Bill wouldn't wouldn't uh, eat market salads. You know, that was just that was just too green for him. <laughs> That's the thing. And we uh, so and in point of fact, you could say the German permaculture movement at the beginning they put in a hell of a lot of of um, emphasis on how this was bringing in really good and organic food and, and yeah and I mean because, because and because they started putting in you know we have direct connection to the Gesellschaft für Gesundheitsberatung mm -hmm. you know they they give permaculture courses I've given permaculture courses there they have a permaculture building which I designed or helped design. Um, they have a permaculture garden where they take the stuff for their courses. And I mean, it's just amazing what, what's gone on. I mean, this is the other thing that and it's, I think is what it keeps me going and keeps my energies going. It's, it's just that I see all these things that I've been, I haven't done. I have just poked. I've poked people to do and they've gone and done it. Which and so, effective. you know, and I always say the best teacher makes himself redundant because yeah. then he's really got through. And that's why I always say if a PhD candidate hasn't got to the point where he's absolutely fed up of his teachers, then he hasn't really learned now what he should have learned. <laughs> And it just, just there's, there's another storyline because you mentioned action learning earlier, and and you also mentioned at the beginning that at the very heart of universitas is all together and not all separate in different silos and disciplines. And there, there was another little episode in 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 your rich and wonderful life where where you helped. Like first, first of all. When did Andy Langford come into the story of permaculture in Europe? Um, because he also um, brought, well, certainly helped bring it to the UK. Um, and, and he then, was a perfect person for UK. Uh, and and, and I, I didn't have to do it. I mean, what, what happened was Andy, Andy had the same, and he told me in the meantime, he had the same sort of, uh, you could say, aha, a, a thing happened to him. When uh, he was this, you know, a cobbler, a shoemaker. Mm -hmm. From that's his, his his original thing. But he was he was one who always did courses on the side, etc. And he heard about this thing, permaculture, and then he just immediately went into it. He was hardly, I mean, he was hardly into it, and then he was teaching it, mm -hmm. and he was organizing it, and he's a good organizer. Mm -hmm. And he is also a philosopher. I mean, he's, I don't know if you've seen his latest book. He's got a new book out. Mm -hmm. I haven't seen it yet, but um, just uh, ordered it. Mm -hmm. But, uh, um, and he really got going there, down there in Tottenham, and uh, where there were like minded people. Mm -hmm. And then he, he it's true, um, Jen. He then met up with um, Leora, mm -hmm. and they actually, uh, that was a big schism at one point. In yeah, the, the, the guy but education, went, guy university said, split. Yeah. We have to concentrate, if we want to get a university going, we have to concentrate, we can't be doing it on the side. Mm. And Hilda felt that they had stolen her thing. And But the, see, the thing is, 
the, none of us are inventors. We are, in point of fact, put together. Channel, channel, channels, life, life coming through. Yeah. Like, it, get and out of the way and let it come through. To everybody yeah. from the very beginning. And this was my point to see. When, when I was doing the whole thing of these 17 countries and the first two, by the way, supported by them, you yeah. know, and so then what I was doing was I was going before I went there, there was something like 17 letters that went out to find people in that course who could be the multipliers. So I was looking immediately for somebody who would go ahead with it. Mm -hmm. and, and then I would uh, identify, like in Poland, I identified people who could speak English and be German, and there wasn't that many. I'm talking about the time of Solidarność. Mm -hmm. And um, they just opened to freedom of speech and, and discussion. So every permaculture course lasted twice as much than anywhere else because they were so um, joyous to be able to discuss. Mm -hmm. But what meant it, we, I really got deep with them. And then I identified all these people. I was there for two lecture uh, tours. The lecture tours I have never been used as much in my life as in Poland. I would have two, day, two lectures per day. I was 14 days the, fir the first time, and I did 21 lectures. And, two pe pe and with slides, and sometimes where the slides didn't work because there were too much light and all this. <laughs> I mean, but they immediately fixed things up in Whitehall. And uh, I actually came back uh, the second time from Poland, the day before the wall came down. And instead of three hours going through Berlin, the train went through in 45 minutes. Mm. And with all the checks again, but they're many quick. And all the time while we're in the train, we're hearing Fry Height, Yes, you know, freedom now, uh, going on, on the streets below because the train went through East Germany, you know, and you could see the people in the streets below. And I was just, I don't think I'd forgotten how to pray until that moment. I began praying, God, if this happens without bloodshed, you know? And then mm -hmm. I get home and they're all into my living room because I was the only one who had television. And they were all <laughs> in here and they're all crying. And yeah. from the television. It was a moving, moving moment for, for Germans. Um, yeah. And of course, okay. that was another thing yeah. that happened then. After that happened, you see, I was, uh, and I was invited then to all these newly opened countries mm. because um, they were now allowed to have foreigners and the all wanted ecology. Mm. That was the first thing that the East Germans thought of. That was the first thing that Slovenians thought of, mm. you know. We, we go for ecology. Okay, permaculture, here. And, and then, you know, and... and and I had a, so I still have it. I mean, I can go to almost any of these countries, you know, and I, and I'm immediately red carpet sort of thing, yeah. Well, I mean, you've, yeah, but we, we, were, we were going down the, the, whoops, Dyer University story, because you, you actually were, were quite um, helpful to, to Liora and, and Andy then in, because you had the academic weight, which they didn't have. Like you, you were a professor, you knew how universities work, you knew the whole system in Europe. Um, so uh, how did that evolve, the, the helping to set up Gaia University? Uh, well, the thing was they had decided they were not gonna have any professors. Mm -hmm. They were gonna work only with advisors. Mm -hmm. And they are, were going to work on a very individualistic level. The student decided what they were, what they were teaching, learning. Very open at the first. They've gone a little bit more structured now. Um, but uh, they still have this idea that you can choose your own advisors. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, uh, students weren't ready. and They didn't always know who they could choose especially in yeah. when they were doing something like eco-social design or something like that. Well, this, this is interesting because this for me is, is one of those, the, the, the blind spots of the, the kind of extreme participation 
movement of let it all emerge and come out of the the round um, and no input whatsoever is that if you deal with a group of people that have been badly educated in the wrong kind of way and manipulated by mass media and advertising and all those kind of things when you then when they then come together and co-create something on the basis of with the best of intentions and the highest of hopes and wonderful people but they they can only invent well play with the building blocks they were given and, and that's why i often find it's a both and you have to give some input in order to um give people a bigger spectrum and then they have to choose which pieces that you've presented to them make sense to them and are meaningful and adapt them in ways that that makes makes sense to place to get, get used the students used to being their own busts yeah. because they're really being their own busts. they're not nobody is so are, are very few so what we did was we said uh, and what I did was I, I just put my tongue in my cheek and I just wrote to people that I had met in Vinthorn, that I had met in uh, Timbuktu and that I had met in Australia and I'd met, you know, all over the world. And uh, it didn't matter who, see, because I, I have this thing of Don Camillo, you know, Don Camillo and never stop till you get to the top. You know, I, I was always that way. I wouldn't, I, so, and my dad used to say also, you know, the president of Ireland, when he has no underpants on, he looks very like you. Yeah? <laughs> so, and that sort of, in other words, cool it down. We're all the same and we're all, uh, uh, we're all one. And so I got all these people. I got 72 people onto the advisory board within something like five months. Mm. It wasn't even a half year. And... Um, so much so that um, Andy and, and Laura didn't know quite what to do. They were sort of, where am I now? <laughs> but um, then they slowly got it going and Albert helped as well. To see, Albert who, who was always um, and not only a Gen person, but he was you know, a person who was really interested in passing on things. He was always teaching, he was always into, research and, and even inventing you know and, and i mean it's such a I, 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 I thought that interview was great yeah. by the way thank you very much <laughs> and i love the man and we really get on very well together every time we see each other and it's um such a pity we're so far apart mm. but i albert uh you know it was such a beautiful thing because we had albert as they said in genius inventing person who was a hippie then we had um and a lawyer <laughs> what and a lawyer and a lawyer yeah and then we had um a draftsman and a gardener which was max lindica mm -hmm. and then here's declan kennedy supposedly an academic but actually a rebel academic you could say and leaving things and and then in the background Hamish Stewart who was very smart he still has this wonderful little farm up in the north of Denmark and he this Danish wife and he has lovely concerts there and I was there the concert uh, three years ago and did an Irish dance there <laughs> and he had Irish music going and everything it's, it's, a delightful man and um and these four we were the uh, well we were known as the three lads because they were the official people outside and he was the man who did all the organization and the 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 solid work in the background the administration and and then ross and hilda were the two who were giving the money but that was the beautiful thing was that they weren't the Ford Foundation type. Mm. They were they wanted to be part of yeah. what was happening, and so so they were you know had the perfect example of um, uh, action research mm. where you act and research together, mm. and uh, it was it was a fantastic time. Mm. And then Margaret was somewhat on the side because Margaret was more going the academic line where I had to gone away from it. 
And so she kept teaching as a professor while she was. No, she became teaching. she became a professor after she moved here. Uh -huh. um, but but but, but doing the, the currency work on the site. So she on the one that she had building yes. technology. And that was, and, that was, was one was really bad for her, and that was the reason why she retired early. She retired at the age of sixty-two. But talk about retirement! It was anything but the opposite. You know, she really got going then. <laughs> and I mean, what I, I don't know whether you could, I could say that, but I often think the crash that 2008 was the beginning of the end of her um, health. Mm -hmm. But the stupid thing about it was she had cancer. She didn't know it because she had no pain. And only when she only realized it because she had blood in her stool. And then she, the diagnosis was the whole body. It wasn't just one organ. And she was gone then within four months. And that was, uh, yeah, seven years ago. And I still really haven't got over it. Mm -hmm. I'm, I don't, I don't want, sympathy or anything like that, but I think I'm over it and I'm good and I'm doing everything, you know, and I'm happy and whatnot. And then all of a sudden it just hits me, you know, and I, I whew, yeah. Mm. But um, on the other hand, I sometimes think she got out of the way to allow me to go further. Mm. Because, because if I had been taking care of a sick person mm. no um i wouldn't be able to go on what i was been doing yeah i i experienced it for six months where i was almost only you know my, my <coughs> professorship in berlin was infrastructure im stadtbaubereich mm. and i all of a sudden i was just infrastructure for her mm. i'd already started being infrastructure because i was uh, i did all the, her uh getting the books translated and all that sort of thing. I did all that for her on the side of my work. <laughs> and I just don't know how we did it, but we kept going and we, and we seemed to enjoy it. Well, I, I certainly, I mean, we, we met, I think in person sh a few years ago, shortly after Margaret died, it was, um, you came to Mallorca to, to um, spend some time at Margaret's brother's place and um, and I'm I'm amazed to see how, how you've also recovered and and w went from strength to strength since then. You've do, doing all sorts of new projects and new research. Um, and where where where's your your growing edge right now? Like where what's the next step for Declan? Well, the, the, um, this next step for me is a um, bit more. Um, time for myself mm. and for my own spirituality. I'm finding out uh, why I made all, a lot of decisions from the spiritual side, uh, because I've gone back into my own Celtic spirituality. Mm -hmm. And um, of course, this has come up and is much more open uh, in the last 10 or 15 years in Ireland and, and abroad. Mm -hmm. It's um, the, and the connection from Celtic spirituality to its roots, which is in actually India. You know, the Celts came from India, all the way up the Danube. You know, the, the reason why it's called Danube is Dana, the Celtic goddess. And they settled there for three or 400 years, moving all the way up to Dona Eschingen. And, um, and then going across to Brittany and, and Basque country, and then moving to the new world, but not getting there, getting to the west of Ireland. Mm -hmm. and that was how they finished up then taking over Ireland. But you see, my red head, which was like yours, do you remember? We were both father yeah. and son, <laughs> yeah, because of the red head. Yeah. Um, but my red hair is from the Vikings which is the opposite to the 
the Celts, you could say, yeah. they were fighting each other in 1014. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, I, I often think that, that like part of my northern German family probably also had some Vikings come up the river and because um, I, I don't look particularly German. <laughs> and <laughs> it's in Scotland, I've, I felt never as at home in a place uh, as in Scotland and was never as accepted as and like, I mean, I just don't, I can't cope with the northern weathers. So so that's why I ended up on Mallorca. But um, but the Scots were the most warm and welcoming people that, that I've ever experienced. Um, yeah, I lived there for a couple of years too. Yeah, I, I, there's one, one last question, which is kind of a bit unrelated, but it's a lovely little story because um, when, we, when we met at Flinthorn um, and we were walking through the dunes together, um, we, we somehow, because there was this connection through Dundee University, I, I was there f visiting f f for some reason, and um, you told me a story that while you were a, a teacher at Dundee University, um, this very unknown band was playing in the Dundee Student Union. Um, tell, tell me that story again, because it's just so nice. No, uh, we... Um, uh, two of us lecturers and the students union in the architect and planning departments of the Dundee School, which was then called the Duncan of Jordan's College of Art. Which is where I got my PhD. <laughs> yeah, and um, yeah, I visited the, the last time I was in Scotland mm -hmm. and actually met one of the secretaries. She was at the door mm -hmm. when I went there. Yeah, but, um, right. But, they decided to have a um, student conference and they called it um, Open Design. Mm -hmm. And they were saying, we're talking about the non-built environment. You had to say that at that time. Mm -hmm. The non-built environment, because the environment was supposed to be built here around you. Yeah. And so we invited all sorts of different people who had, were not architects, but who had to, to do with planning or ecology, et cetera. And uh, they invited, I was maybe more or less their research um, department for that conference. And then they found this group and the group were all in white, uh, the band, but they had purple light on them the whole time. Mm -hmm. And the purple light was moving through all sorts of different shades of purple. This is 1960s we're talking, so mid 1960s or something. Yeah, almost the end of the 60s. Yeah. yeah. It's the time of the revolutions going on here. Mm -hmm. That was the sort of light revolution that was going on there. And we were showing the Danish guy and I were showing them how they could uh, learn free and how they could choose things, etc. And this, this conference, and then what was their name? Their name was Deep Purple. And we didn't realize what we had. And we paid them 30 pounds for the evening. <laughs> About something like six months later, you know, they were on the, the top notch, <laughs> you know, the, the, the the tops, as they called it then, yeah. yeah. Wonderful. The first of the tops, yeah. yeah. Had done the, be the best um, al album, yeah. But they were so much fun mm. um, playing. They played all the way through the whole evening. Mm. And the Scots dish people, they danced like blazers and they had- They like to do. <laughs> it was great. And they had a good hall also in the Duncan. Gordon, uh, Jordan style College of Art. They had a really good hall that you could then clear it, back and make a dance. One, one thing that, that um, I find really remarkable about Duncan of Jordan and Dundee University is, is that if, if you look at the work of Sir Patrick Geddes and the vision that this man had, um, with his book Cities in Evolution or with, with the, the final book he wrote with an Aberdeen University professor on the general theory of life 
um, and biology. Mm -hmm. um, he is not only the founding father, like with, with, the, with the Edinburgh Festival, having evolved out of the Edinburgh Summer School that Geddes started, where he would invite people like um, Ernst Haeckel and, and um, all sorts of intellectual from all over Europe to basically just publicly discuss and create a true university. Um, and then the, the way he, he moved into Edinburgh, uh, Edinburgh Old Town to work with the, with the, the, the low lives and the prostitutes to, to basically do participatory urban renewal, um, even understanding the process of gentrification by, by creating the first student union in the middle of the slum, which is now the Edinburgh Old Town and the, the area around the castle. And in particularly what, what I still find, this is like a lot of people now ask me, how do you, how do you um, bring cultural institutions into um, the, the process of creating regenerative cultures? And Geddes' idea of the Outlook Tower, a public museum where you walk in on the ground floor and, and you have the first floor exhibition of the world, the next floor exhibition of Europe, the next floor exhibition of the United Kingdom, and then Scotland, and then Edinburgh, and then the Camera Obscura, high-tech stuff at the time, um, to show you the city. That's nested wholeness. That's giving the normal person in the street of Edinburgh an experience of how their city sits in the nested wholeness of a living planet. Um, I, I still think that, that like the whole, now that bioregionalism is, is coming um, sort of to the forefront again, um, Geddes always said like the, 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 the valley section is a plan new towns in the context of your region. Um, did, when, and, Geddes, when you and Geddes, Geddes um, Greek friend was Dino Stratiatis. <sighs> and Sir Johnson Marshall and yeah. Matthew Matthews, yeah. they were part of the movement there. And I was working with them then, and Bucky Fuller and people like that were working with me in, in, um, in the acoustic <laughs> movement in, in Athens. And we um, I even actually built a geodesic dome out of uh, 60 centimeter pieces of wood mm -hmm. in a small village, Korapi uh, in Attica, where um, the editor of the acoustics magazine, Professor Jack Jacqueline Tyrrell, an English woman, had mm -hmm. built a house and she invited him to stay with her while he was in. So, and then after the conference, we, all the young people went with him to her garden and then built this stone. And it's still there. It's right beside the new, uh, the new airport in Coropee. It's and, uh, I saw it the only, you know, two years ago when I was uh, um, at Laura Shannon's wedding in Greece. Do you remember Laura? Yeah, her name rings a bell, but I- Dancer, the Laura Dancer of Fenthorn. Ah, yeah. she's still there. Uh -huh. and, and she's married now to a, a Greek uh -huh. fiddler uh -huh. and they're still doing their dancing all over the place. So I have quite a lot of contact with her. I, so I, that's fascinating. Is it, like I, I was always impressed by this, this lineage that, that kind of starts with Geddes and then Geddes um, really influenced Mumford. And um, then he, the, 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 then McHarg took a class in, in after after he got delisted after the Second World War, he took a class that was um, taught in London for ex-servicemen on uh, urban development and landscape planning. That was and she was a Gedesian. So the Ian Ian McHark's design with nature came out of Geddes and Mumford, um, mm -hmm. and and then of course McHark very strongly influenced the the folks at the New Alchemy Institute, like um, John Todd and, and 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 all those guys and and. Um, but, but did you actually, so you actually met Bucky and worked with Bucky in, in Greece? Yeah. And, oh, wow, I didn't know that. Yeah, I, I visited him once, the very first time I was in the States, I visited him in, in Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. um, but it was very short because I was, he'd forgotten me, I hadn't forgotten him, obviously. Mm -hmm. and, uh, um, but we had a great time in Greece together and, and then 
I, I, he used to, he, he had two left feet, you know, he couldn't dance at all, but he loved to do it. You know, I mean, he just, he, just, and he was so large, you know. He was, yeah. and, and you know who another person I met there was um, Margaret Mead, oh, nice. the, the anthropologist. Yeah. And we actually, we actually um, designed our uh, marriage and our, our marriage on Margaret Mead's suggestion that she got out of Samoa. The Samoa has, has the seven year marriage. Mm -hmm. And then you, you marry again, are you split? And there's no ignominity about it. Mm. And um, she said, what in the Western society, what we should do, we should make a marriage contract and we should renew this marriage contract at seven or 10 years. So we took 10 years and that's what we did. Every 10 years, we sat down for a whole day or maybe a whole weekend and discussed with each other what's going right, what's going wrong, what do we want to change, etc. Sometimes it was only very something similar, as simple. Other times it was really deep stuff, but it meant that we always had this review. With, Wonderful. That's, thank you for that inspiration. I, I only, I mean, Alice and I've been on, on a journey together for almost 25 years now, but well, we only got married um, sh a month before our daughter was born um, three and a half years ago. And mm. so I, I think that's a really wise thing to do, to, to set a rhythm of, of having a review <laughs> and, and a, and a kind of forward planning exercise of what our commitments and and yeah lovely thank you for that that I'll, I'll, I'll well, bring that back to eco -villiers. what i have done um here is i've had a look at we're now 35 years old mm -hmm. um lives garden mm -hmm. and um this year uh, last, no last year we were 35 years old and i had a look at the seven year itch mm -hmm. And we ha had always, the beginning of each of the seven years, we had a small or larger catastrophe mm. and made us rethink and get something going. Mm. And this is what's been going on now in 2020. We've had, even though we've had Corona, <coughs> we've had an immense new input of young people who are now really taking over and they're all in for sustainability, and it's just amazing. Um, how many people now live at Lebensgarten? Oh, I'm not quite sure anymore, but somewhere about 200. Oh, wow, okay. We're including about 40 children. Mm. Lovely. Mm. Right, I think we should probably wrap up, otherwise <laughs> even, even the <laughs> really... Talk, but it's been a lovely talk, and thank yeah. you very much indeed. And you're really, as ever, you're also inspiring, and I think... Um, I, I, I love to hear your work and read it and to see it as you're doing. As, you know, I'm, uh, so um, keep going, dear. And, and try to come to Mallorca. Okay. Part of my heart. Thank okay. you. Likewise. And, and you mentioned that you might have a chance to visit Mallorca in March or so. Um, so please look me up. And, and I want to show you um, this new piece of land that has just oh, yeah. popped it up. Yeah. And give you a couple of tips, maybe. Exactly, yeah, we'll, we'll do yeah. some of that Great of magnetism. Say hello to Alice and to Lucia as well. Yeah, okay, lots of love. Oh, I'll, 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 I'll greet your dear wife very deeply. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.